And we offer up certainly our finances. We recognize, and let's say, let's face it, churches get a, a bad rap for asking about money, being focused on money. I don't think that's necessarily the case. I don't think we are focused on, but we recognize it's, it's important to do what we need to do. The, um, the lights in the sanctuary couldn't come on. The technology that we use uh, to, to share the service couldn't uh, be available. Um, your pastor would not be paid if there were not funds. But we recognize that the greater part of our offering isn't in what we place in the offering plate. It's not the check we mailed in or the, the credit card number that we used online. It's the intent of our heart. It's our attitude. It's that whole cheerful giver thing that makes a difference. When I was a kid, we used to sing to him all the time. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills. It's actually not in our home, our current home here. He doesn't need money. God doesn't need your tithe. He needs your spirit that's behind the tithe. He needs your heart, your attitude. That joyfully giving, gladly looking, uh, how can I contribute to the kingdom? And we recognize that that doesn't stop with finances. That it goes into how we use our time, how we use our energy, how we take those things about which we're passionate and say, how can I make my passion a ministry on behalf of Jesus Christ? How can I use who I am, the way God made me to touch others. That recognition that there are ways that, that you communicate, that you are involved with people, that you network, that you connect, that you don't. And God uses all of our gifts together to serve the purposes of his kingdom. And that's why when you read those different lists of, of gifts like Paul might mention in the New Testament, they, they don't all match up perfectly. They're not meant to be all-inclusive. They're meant to be an example to show these are various ways in which God has blessed us, and we can use these gifts to bless His name. And so today we dedicate not only what's in offering plates and, and what's been uh, taken from our, our bank accounts electronically, but what's in our hearts? What's our attitude behind our giving? This is our gift before the Lord. Let's dedicate all these gifts even now. Holy God, we thank you. We thank you for the ways you have touched our lives, the way you've been a blessing to us, first and foremost, through Jesus Christ. As we sang earlier, there's a wideness in God's mercy. And we, we sang how God's love is beyond the measure of our mind. How abundantly you have loved us. How you have lavished grace and mercy and goodness on us. How you have gifted us, each uniquely, individually formed and created, that we can be a part of ministry in your name. We thank you. We ask, Lord, that as we bring ourselves that we be the sacrifice, that, that we be the gift, and that you use us, that we are good stewards of all that we are as we continue to meet the needs of your people. And we recognize that each one of us has a different, uniquely shaped ministry, that we minister together as Scotch Plains Baptist Church. We minister together as American Baptist Churches in New Jersey and USA, as Baptists, as Christians, we minister together, but each of us separately touches lives. Give us some of that grace in touching lives that we use our gifts in a way that brings glory, not to us, not to our church, not to our denomination, but brings glory to the name of Jesus Christ. It's in that name that we pray together. Our hymn this morning, if you're using one of our hymnals from, from the church, hymn number 375, if you have our worship packet, it's included in there, Heavenly Sunlight. Let's sing together, hymn number 375, Heavenly Sunlight. <laughs>
is that we sing His praise. Now, often we literally sing His praises when we gather for worship. Or maybe you get one of those little earworms, a song that's stuck in your head and you keep singing it. Perhaps this week you'll keep kind of humming lines from Heavenly Son. Or maybe there's another one that comes to you and it, it stays with you and we, we sing His praises. But we sing His praises in how we live our lives, don't we? If we go about on Sunday talking about how blessed we are, how we've received the love of God, how He's done so much for us, how we have this sunlight, but then we leave here and talk about all the gloom and the darkness in the world. When we focus on the tragedies that we see on the news, when we worry about what's coming next. We might be singing praises with our lips, but we're, we're not walking in sunlight anymore. We're, we're stuck in shadow. We're stuck in the rain clouds. We sing His praises by the way we live our lives. Even now, as we gather for prayer together, as we, we bring up the things that concern us, the things that worry us, when we bring up those that we've lost, when we bring up medical challenges, financial catastrophes, even as we bring those things, we bring them walking in sunlight, singing His praises. We recognize that we bring them to God because He has been faithful. He has proven Himself time and again that He is faithful, that He loves us. That he has a plan. That he desires good for us. And so even, even when we've got a little nervousness, a little fear, when we're dealing with some things that make us sad, we come to him knowing suddenly, knowing Praise as well. Join with me as we pray together. Holy God, we come before you today thanking you for this day. Recognizing that this day is enough. Oh, we, we've got some trouble that we left behind yesterday. We've got some worry about what might be tomorrow, but we thank you for this day that you've given us. We thank you for your provision to get us through these moments. We thank you for the joy, the sunshine that we have in Jesus. We thank you that we can find a way to praise him, even on dark days. Even on days when it's rainy, that we know the sun still shines above those clouds. We're reminded of your constant love, even when we're not feeling our best today. We know you love us, and we thank you. And because we know of your love, demonstrated through Jesus Christ, we know that you care about us. And that there's nothing that we can bring to you that's too big for you to handle. And there's nothing that we can bring to you that's so insignificant that you just don't care. And so we pour ourselves out before you today, and we bring everything. We bring the names of those we've lost. We bring our bereavement. We bring the names of those that we're, we're praying that your comfort will rest upon them. That your peace will be known to them. That your presence will surround them. We bring tragedy and death and illness and injury, accident and age. We bring before you our students gone off to university and college and the challenges that that might present. Our students here in New Jersey getting ready to go back to school and recognizing that across the country most other public schools have already started. And we bring the challenges that teachers and administrators are facing. We recognize that there's a lot of things that administrations are doing, and no matter what they do, there's somebody mad. We bring them before you, and we pray that our students will be encouraged, will be welcomed, will 
have a, an environment created in which they can learn. And they can excel. And they can achieve. And we thank for all of those that go in and prepare for that. We pray for those who are even now getting in those last minute summer vacations. Who are out on the, the roads traveling. Who are getting some relaxation that are recharging their batteries. Give them, O oh Lord, some rest. And for those that could not get away, who have obligations that keep them from vacationing, Lord, give them rest in you. Give them peace. Lord, for some that are, are part of our church family, even a good night's sleep would be a vacation. These are minds that keep us up at night, that have us tossing and turning. And Father, be with us as we continue to minister to one another. Not only in the church, but in our communities. We recognize that there's a great need for love and peace. For humanity. There's a great need for presence. There's a need for some joy. Lord, there's, there's a need that we can fill. Help us have the grace to do so. And Lord, where there are those who are, are sick, be with them. Where there are those who are struggling, whether it be with, with finances or with mental health or with, with addiction. Where those, there are those who are contemplating, is life worth living? Make yourself known. Make your presence known. And Lord, if we can be part of the answer, if we can be part of making you known, allow us to do so. Open our eyes to see the ways in which we can touch lives and share your love. And Father, forgive us for those times when we let those things pass us by. When we've been too busy or too distracted or too focused on ourselves to see how we can bless someone else. And Father, when we're overextended, when we're at the point that we are so weak we're not doing anybody any Give us that rest in you. Give us that Sabbath, that restoration. Even now, in these moments, may this be a time of re-equipping, re-strengthening, re joy of ministry ahead of us. Father, you've heard our prayer requests, you've seen our prayer list, you know what's in our hearts, and we bring all of these things before you. And offer each one of them according to your will in the name of Jesus Christ. The only name in which we pray. Amen. Last week, we were reading in, in the Gospel of Mark. Now, we had jumped back to Mark. We've been in Mark. We've scooted out for a little bit, and now we've, we've returned. We're in Mark chapter 7. And if you remember, last week we were, we were talking about Jesus receiving some criticism from some of the leaders who thought his disciples weren't following tradition. They weren't doing the things that they should have been doing. And, and they brought that as an accusation about the disciples, really as an accusation about Jesus, because you should be, if you're this great rabbi, you should be teaching them better. And Jesus kind of pointed out, well, you know what? You're really good at following 
the traditions that you've made up, the rules that you've created to kind of explain how to be righteous, but you've forgotten about being righteous. You've forgotten about the attitudes that go beyond these things. Matter of fact, you've created some rules that go contrary to what God intended. That are against the things that God has told you to do. That you've made escapes. you found a, a back door. you found an out. So that you don't have to live the love that God told you to live. But you're real good at following the rules. We ended that section by reading Mark chapter 7 verse 13. Where it says you nullify the word of God by your tradition that you have handed down. And you do many things like that. You do many things like that. Now Jesus spoke that to the people who were challenging him. Who were challenging him based on what his disciples were doing. But he really speaks that to us as well, doesn't he? You do many things like that. We do many things like that. We find ways to skirt around our responsibility. We find where the loophole is to get us out of the action that we know we should take. We find justifications for actions that we do take that we know better than to take. I think we need to hear that verse 13 addressed to us. And Chaz, you do many things like that. Because let's be honest, it would be a lot easier if we could say you and point to other people. You do things like that. You need to be more like me. But when we're honest with ourselves, we know that he speaks that truth into our lives. So much so that Mark doesn't end this discourse there. He doesn't end this discussion there. He doesn't end this, this episode. He continues with verse 14, and that's where we're going to pick up today. Again, Jesus called the crowd to him and said, Listen to me, everyone. And understand this. Now, I kind of see, I kind of see Jesus in this situation being like a teacher who has given an assignment to the class, has explained exactly what to do, has made it very clear, has asked, are there any questions? And now the classroom has descended into chaos and they're not doing what the teacher instructed. Listen to me, everyone, and understand this. I, I picture the coach who has been explaining to the team that they've run through drills and they've done chalkboard exercises and they've walked through and now they get onto the field and it's chaos. And I feel like the coach is blowing the whistle. Listen to me, everyone, understand this. Huddle up, folks. We need to review this. I kind of hear a parent stomping downstairs to the basement where the kids have been playing. And said, all right, enough. Listen. Understand this. I hear Jesus speaking to me. How many years have we been doing this? How many times has this been laid out before you? How many times have you read this? Have you taught about this? How many times have you prayed about this? Listen and understand this. You're just not getting it. Verse 15, nothing outside a person can defile them by going into them. Rather, it is what comes out of a person that defiles them. See, Jesus is getting to the basis of what this, this tension has been, what this argument has been. Hey, they're not following tradition. They haven't ritually washed their hands. They're ritually unclean. Isn't that a terrible thing to be doing? How can you allow this? How can you speak with any kind of authority when the people who follow you don't even do the most basic things? Jesus is right. You're hung up on these basic things and you need to understand it's not those things that defile you. You're saying they're unclean, that they're defiled because they haven't gone through 
this procedure, I'm saying uncleanness comes from inside you. The NIV skips what might be verse 16 and goes to verse 17. There's a, a footnote you might have there that some manuscripts include here the words, if anyone has ears to hear, let them hear. Well, let, let, let's, let's face it, that could be a rubber stamp that we could print this evidence about anything that Jesus says, stamp. Stamp. Are you listening? Can you hear? I think that particularly apt after he says, listen to me, everyone, and understand this. To kind of wrap that up with if anyone has ears to hear, let them hear. Are you really listening? Verse 17, after he left the crowd and entered the house, his disciples asked him about this parable. Now, i got to tell you, that strikes me a little odd. Because I didn't hear a parable. Now, if you've been in church long enough, you've heard somebody, you might have even heard me say, a parable is a heavenly story with an earthly meaning. It's one of those, the kingdom of heaven is like. It's the story that we're supposed to get the lesson from. That we're supposed to get the, the moral to the story is. And I didn't hear that story here. Well, parable can also mean something with a, a hidden meaning. It could also mean um, something that's kind of hard to, to see the point. That maybe the meaning is hidden in a, in a little shadow. What they're asking is, can you, can you shine, shine some light into that shadow so we can see what the point was? I don't think that the disciples were saying, hey, that's a cute story, Jesus. What's the moral to it? I think they're just saying, okay, I hear what you're saying, but I don't quite get it. You told us to understand, but I don't really understand. Because all my life I've grown up that there are certain things that we do that defile us. There are certain actions we take, certain foods that we eat, and certainly even this idea of not washing our hands can defile us. And again, that probably wasn't a, a, a cleanliness factor like you know, our hand sanitizer that we've been going through in the past several months, but more a ritual cleaning. You know, it's, it's probably kind of like this tradition, this ritual that you take. It's probably like something that maybe in your home you've encountered, maybe in your family you've encountered. Do you pray before the meal? Does the family pray together? And what are the, what are the exceptions to that? And heaven forbid, have you ever been to church where there's a a gathering and there's a meal and somebody didn't pray first. I mean, you've got to pray first, right? Well, one of it's, a, 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 it's an open house. And it's kind of a buffet and people come and go. What if you're out in a restaurant? What if it's a big family picnic and there's 50 people all over the place and they can't hear the prayer anyway? What about somebody who said, well, I was a little hungry earlier, so I already said my prayer and so I'm, I, I don't have to pause for you. See, we can point out, oh, look at those Pharisees with their ritual hand washing. Well, what about our ritual meal blessing? They were getting a little, little concerned because, uh-oh, we started eating and nobody blessed us. Well, what's that really mean? You and I kind of grown up with that. We kind of expect that, that blessing. Well, the disciples had grown up with, no, you're supposed to wash your nuts, but some of them weren't doing it. But then Jesus says, yeah, but I really don't have to. Well, now that confuses everybody. Because of the rules, the rules are not the rules. So Jesus, could you explain this parable? Can you shine some light on, on the hidden meaning? And boy, do I hear him speaking to me in this next line. Are you so dull? Are you really that dense? Can you really not get this very simple point? And I gotta be honest, oftentimes my answer, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, particularly in hindsight. Particularly looking back, I don't always catch it in the moment, but looking back, I'm like, how, 
How could I be so dumb? How could I have been so dull that I didn't catch that? My wife would tell you that just like there's that commercial on with Captain Obvious, I could be Captain Oblivious. Things can go right by me and I don't catch them at all. And we've got story after story after story that we can tell. One of the ones that comes to mind every time I think about this, and when a conversation comes up about how oblivious I am, there was years ago, um, we had a gathering at the house, had some folks there and, uh, outside enjoying a nice summer day that went into evening, and people left, and some people remained, and my wife finally went to bed, and, I, and there were two people left. This, this guy and this girl who were left, and not, not guy and girl, kids, they were, they were young adults, um, that were left, and, and we're hanging out, and finally I'm like, you know what? I'm tired, and I got church tomorrow, so lock the door on your way out, and I'm in the bed. And the next day, I was, I was telling her about that, so oh, how late did you stay on? And I said, and these two were still here. And she said, they were waiting for you to leave. They were waiting for some time alone. They were waiting for you to leave. I'm like, since when? She said, it's been weeks. It's been months this has been going on. You haven't noticed it. It's been right under your nose. How many times have they been here? I was oblivious. I did get to officiate their wedding later on. <laughs> Are you so tall? Are you so dense? Is it laid out right in front of you and you miss the point? And I've got to say, yes, I often do. And I think God knows that about us. We can't be too hard on ourselves. He knows that. He understands. But it's got to be frustrating. I mean, it's frustrating for you, isn't it, when you keep telling somebody, when you take off your shoes, put them here. When you're done with that coffee mug, this is what you need to do with it. Are you really so dumb? Well, I have good intention, but yeah, I miss it sometimes. I'm oblivious. There's a, there's a song that was popular in the 70s. It is really about this idea of missing things. Thinking we're, we're more than we are. Thinking we're more on top of things than we really are. It was released in the fall of uh, 1976. And in the spring of 1977, it made it all the way up to number 11. It never broke the top 10. But for this group, it's a very important song. It's really kind of groundbreaking. It's really kind of what broke them into mainstream thinking. It's by a band named Kansas. And some of you, if you're able to come up with Kansas, you, you might come up with Dust in the Wind. And that's not the one I'm talking about. That, that actually came on the next album. But Carrie Lidgreen wrote a song for Kansas. Now, they, they were recording their album. They'd actually recorded pretty much all of it. And he came into the studio and said, hey guys, last night I, I got this song. Now, he tells the story that it kind of was beamed down to him, that it was perhaps divinely inspired. Carrie left Lindgren eventually left Kansas to go solo, and part of his solo was a Christian musician. He, he was deeply spiritual. He hadn't converted yet at this point, but he was, he was probably what we might today in our language call it a seeker. He was trying to understand. And this song, he, he now believes, came to him inspired. And it's called Carry On, Wayward Son. Now, i got to tell you, I don't think I ever... Referred to that That's actually the name of the song, Carry On Wayward Son. But the first line of the song, and it's a line throughout the song, is Carry On My Wayward Son. And if you were to hear this on the radio, it starts a cappella. And it's, it's beautifully powerful 
when you hear this first line, carry on, my wayward son, there will be peace when you are done. That waywardness kind of catches us, doesn't it? That wayward, that kind of doing our own thing, not following anything specific but or that's been laid out, but choosing something else. We're all kind of wayward, aren't we? And in the song kind of expresses this idea of you think you're doing the right thing, but you're, you're, you're really off track. You're missing what's out there. But keep trying. Keep going. And I wonder how many times Jesus, like he did in verse 18, looks at us and says, are you still dull? Are you really still missing this? Are you still choosing your own way instead of what I've put out there? Are you, are you purposely misinterpreting what I'm telling you? But keep going. Come on. I'm not kicking you off the team. I'm not throwing you out of the classroom. Keep, keep on with me. Carry on my way, or carry on my way, son. There'll be peace when you are done. Let your, lay your weary head to rest. Don't you cry no more. Part of the verse, just reading some of the verse parts. Though my eyes could see, I still was a blind man. Though my mind could think, I still was a madman. I hear the voices when I'm dreaming. I can hear them say, carry on, my wayward son. Later it says, masquerading as a man with a reason. My charade is the event of the season. If I claim to be a wise man, well, it surely means that I don't know. How many of us, we can kind of look at our, our past faith journey and say, well, I, I was masquerading. It was a charade. I was claiming to be a lot smarter than I really was. And now... We all recognize when Jesus says, Are you so dull? He was speaking to me. It says, On a stormy sea of moving emotion, tossed about him like a ship on the ocean, I set a course for winds of fortune, but I hear the voices say, Carry on my wayward son. There will be peace when you are done. Jesus says, Are you so oblivious? Are you missing this? I'm still here. Jesus, who was asleep on the boat when the storm came and they woke him up and he calmed the storm. Jesus who, when the disciples were out of the storm on the boat, walked out of the water and almost went past them. And they called him and he came to them. He knows the stormy seas that we've been on. He knows that we've been tossed about. And he says, are you still fearful? Have you not seen what I can do? It's the same one that when he gives us a lesson and we don't listen to it, he says, are you still so dull? Let me explain again. And again. And again. This line is, this, are you so dull? Comes just a couple of verses after he said, listen to me everyone and understand this. And now he says, don't you see? He continues to explain. Isn't that good to know? Isn't it good to know that when we recognize that we have been dull, that we haven't been paying attention, that what was, what was that you said again? I saw a, a, a cartoon yesterday. It had the husband standing in the door with his keys in his hand. He's leaving and he says to his wife, is there anything on the list? Because you know I'm going to either forget it or get it wrong. When I leave the house to go to the grocery store, my wife says, hey, can you pick up this? I'm like, sure. Oh, and get this? Okay. If she gives me a third thing, I've got to write it down. How many times have you done that? You've gone and you came home with a grocery cart full of stuff and you didn't get what you set out to do? How many times have we been so dull? That Jesus says, let me give it to you again. One more time. Let me calm this storm for you again. Let me walk you through it. Don't you see that nothing that enters a person from the outside can defile them? 
For it doesn't go into their heart, but into their stomach, and then out of the body. Parenthetically, in saying this, Jesus declared all foods clean. He's not really giving a science class on how food is processed. He's really not talking about whether or not there's bacteria in something before you eat it. Or the bacteria that's in your gut that fights that bacteria. He's not talking about any of that. He's just saying, if you think that that is what makes you unrighteous, recognize that doesn't touch your heart. That goes in and out. Serves a function, does something, it's important, but it doesn't really defile who you are. It doesn't change your heart. He went on, what comes out of a person is what defiles them. And again, he's not talking about from that eating process what comes out. He clarifies this with the next verse, next verse that we get here, verse 21. For it is from within, out of a person's heart, that evil thoughts come. See, that's where we're defined. In our thinking. In our heart. How are you sure that you're defiled? Examine your thoughts. Not your actions. Not your words. Not your rituals and your routines. Not your traditions. Not whether you took communion. Not whether or not you prayed before you ate the meal. What are your thoughts? See, because we guard our thoughts pretty well, don't we? I mean, you can smile at somebody and give them one of those southern bless your hearts the whole time meaning something totally different. somebody, say words that speak encouragement, but the whole time be thinking vile thoughts about them. Plotting ways to subvert them, to, to get around them, to climb over them. Your words might have sounded good. The smile on your face might have looked good. Your actions might have appeared true and wholesome and righteous even. But your thoughts betray you. Your thoughts point out your defilement. Outwardly you might have done everything by the book and appear blameless. But that's not. Where defilement comes from. It doesn't come from whether or not you used that language. Whether you gave that gesture. Whether you rolled your eyes or shrugged your shoulders. It's the thought that was in your mind. For it is from within, out of a person's heart, that all evil thoughts come. Sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, folly, all start with a thought. And all these evils come from inside and defile a person. Are you so dull? Listen to me, everyone. Understand this. What comes out of a person is what the Bible says. Let's face it. You held hands and said amen when somebody blessed that food, but the whole time you were thinking about, took it long enough to get here. Doesn't look like the way my mother made it. Can't believe I'm sitting next to this. But you held hands and you said amen and you smiled beautifully at everybody afterwards. 
that blessing didn't change anything. If you skipped the blessing, it didn't mean that the, the food was going to make you sick. Any defilement comes from our hearts. It's where our thoughts are. And I think this is one of the challenges that, that we still struggle with. Because we are pretty good at acting Christian. We know the right things to say and the things not to say. We know how to, how to smile and, and how to act good. How to follow the traditions of our faith practice. We could fool anybody else in our worship space. And we could fool the people in our everyday space. We might even fool the people that we live with at home. Not as likely, but we might. But our thoughts will continue to betray us. No matter how much we clean up our act, no matter how, how much we, we spiffy up our, our speech, Jesus is concerned about what's in your heart. And so earlier, earlier as part of our service, we, we had a call to worship from Psalm 15. Lord, who may dwell in your sacred tent? Who may live on your holy mountain? The one whose walk is blameless, who does what is righteous, who speaks the truth from their heart, whose tongue utters no slander, who does no wrong to neighbor, casts no slur on another, who despises the vile person, but honors those who fear the Lord, who keeps an oath even when it hurts and does not change their mind, who lends money to the poor without interest, who does not accept a bribe against the innocent. Whoever does these things will never be shaken. All of those things come from attitudes. They come from thoughts. And you can probably find a loophole for everything that's mentioned on there. You can probably justify breaking every one of those. And it betrays your thoughts. So how are we doing? How are we doing? Do we have the ears to hear? Are we listening? Or are we still so dull? Do we hear this and say, well, I gotta, I gotta be a little more careful not to let my guard down. Not to drop the facade so easily. Well, then we're back to the words from that song by Canvas, masquerading as a man with a reason. My charade is the event of the season. If I claim to be a wise man, well, it surely means that I don't know. Or do we ask Jesus, hey, help me examine my heart. Dig in there with me. I know it might be painful, but let's get it cleaned out. Are we asking Jesus, hey, hey help, help me to say the right words? Or are we asking him to help me have the right thought? The right attitude? Root out that which is already in me that defiles me. Help me dig out the rot and the decay. Or do we say, hey, let's just, let's just cover that up a little bit better with some Sunday go to meeting clothes. And it'll be good enough. Where is your heart? Let's pray. Holy God, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to again hear your word. To again gather up, huddle around, be still and listen. And yes, Lord, we really are that dull. 
We really are that oblivious. We need to hear it again. Father, we, we know we've said it before. But we say it again today. Create in me a clean heart. Let me clean up the inside before I get hung up on the outside. This, Father, my prayer, our prayer today, in the name of our brother Jesus Christ. Amen. In, in just a moment, we're going to sing a hymn that I've got to be honest with you. I don't know. I don't know how often I've sung it. It's one of those ones that you kind of, well, I just didn't speak for you. For me, I always kind of know it's there. And the chorus is familiar, but when I get to the verses, they, they seem new every time. Seems like I haven't sung it before. Maybe it's because it's kind of an older song. Um, it's actually written by the same guy that wrote In the Garden. Um, but it's been around for a while. And it's one that's kind of easy to take for granted or dismiss because it's been around for a while. And it says strange things like dwelling in Beulah land. Like what in the world is Beulah? And so it's easy to pass it by. But it's a reminder of our, our faith. It's a reminder of, of getting there. It's a reminder of even if things around us don't seem like we're walking in heavenly sunlight, we're all ready. We're all ready experiencing that Sunday. And let's face it, the news of this past week, and I'm sure the news of the week coming up, is going to be hard for some of us. But we're already living in sunshine, living on the mountain, having His favor upon us. Let's sing Beulah Land. If you're using a hymnal, it's hymn number 517. It's included in your worship packet. I actually included um, two different versions of it. I mean, it's the same thing. It's just one's a, a melody, um, and one's got the parts to it. Uh, but I, I included both. And actually, the melody one, I think the words are a little bigger, a little easier for me to see. Well, like in the middle of land, let's sing again.
It's been a while for that, but it's still some good stuff in there. I'm glad that you sang with us. I'm glad that you worshiped with us. I'm glad that we could be together in the Spirit of God. And I hope that you've been blessed by this time. I hope that God has spoken to you in some way. Maybe not in any way that I ever thought of, but He thought of. And He spoke a word into your heart. Maybe you heard something totally different from what I said. But it's the lesson that God wanted you to have. Thanks for being with us. I hope we can worship again soon. Let's receive now the benediction. As you go, go in the name of Jesus Christ. Go in His name and work more on your thoughts than you do on your steps. Work on your attitude. Work on your heart. And in Him, be a blessing. And may you be blessed. Amen.